Jeff, we're here at the FQXI uh, conference on the Observer and events. We're in the Banff Art Museum, beautiful place. Uh, nice to talk about the Observer in a place like this. Why are we still talking about the Observer after a hundred years of the Observer entering the picture in quantum mechanics? So, uh, is there a mystery? Uh, I would say definitely yes. Um, uh, so the first thing is, what do you mean by an observer? Um, if you go back to the beginnings of the modern physics, say about 100 years ago, they weren't really talking about human observer. They were just talking about um, a measuring device and another system. So everything that happened in physics required us to divide a system into a system and a measuring device. Uh, divide the universe at least into two parts, right. a system and a measuring device. And it was believed that everything could be discussed in terms of these kinds of external divided relationships. But I feel the deep thing about observers, which is not even, we haven't even begun to hit the beginning of, is that we have to start talking about what does it mean to, for example, to look inside? What does it mean for us to observe ourselves without making a division between a measuring device and a system? So it's, it's, the, the issue of the observer is, is one of a category of s several things, I believe, that we're still waiting for a major revolution in science. Why uh, is it important to look inside of ourselves if we're, if we're uh, just observing external events in the quantum world or the cosmological world? What, what's the meaning of looking inside ourselves to, to assess what an observer is internally? Well, first of all, um, if we think about our most successful theory of all time, quantum theory, um, what happens in our personal experience, in our internal experience, is, couldn't be more dramatically different from how we understand what's happening in the external world. I, I, I can't emphasize that em enough. It's spectacularly different. It's, every aspect of it is spectacularly different. And so it's, it's and there's still very, there are deep, unsolved problems. For example, we can understand, uh, consider the idea of we both observe something red, mm -hmm. right? So we, I mean, obviously we're both seeing the same frequency of photons and these kinds of things. Um, and we can understand that very well in terms of our theories. They work very well. But we have no idea if what I'm experiencing internally as red has anything to do with what you're experiencing sure. internally as red. And in my view, the inner laboratory, we do experiments on our inner laboratory all the time. This is just as important to understand in terms of physics as the external laboratory. And, and uh, there are some major uh, gaps, huge uh, you know, glaring, you know, a gorilla in the room type of gaps in terms of our, our inner experience. The three big examples I would say are uh, even just awareness. What does it mean to, for a system to look at itself without being mediated, without being divided into two pieces. It's just mm. self-reflexive, it's aware. That's one. A second big one that our physics has no idea, in my opinion, how to deal with is how to talk about meaningful free will. And the third one is our human experience of the flow of time. Mm. So in all these areas, I predict that we'll have a major revolution in physics yet to come. So what can physics conceptually contribute to those three elements? Well, um, so, you know, it, it may be uh, 500 years uh, of, of uh, development in the neurosciences before we can get the right kind of experimental devices to, to figure these things conceptually, out. Conceptually. Right? Conceptually, I, I do believe that very significant progress can be made in these questions. In fact, by using the very same methodology that theoretical physics, at least in the past, has, has used very well. And that methodology is something called the Gedanken experiment. Mm -hmm. and thought experiment. Thought experiment. And so perhaps the, the best examples of this, everybody probably knows how Einstein made some of his big discoveries. Uh, a nice example is, is, is the case of relativity, right? So Einstein, we had these two you know, uh, pedestals of, of, of physics, Newtonian physics, Maxwell equations, electromagnetism, very well established theories, yeah, nothing wrong with them. But as soon as Einstein started to combine them, he saw that there was huge tension between them. For example, 
Newton says that, you know, if I throw a baseball, you know, I can measure the velocity between me and the baseball. If I get in my Ferrari, okay, or whatever, and then throw it, then I have to add the velocities, right? But what happened is that light can travel in empty space, in a vacuum, where there's no medium, right? And so Einstein was able to combine, uh, look at combining the Newtonian physics of adding velocities with Maxwell, and Maxwell said, the light is always going with the same velocity. And he was able to find where those theories were in great tension and do it in a way that he was able to embody, bring deeply uh, into his personal experience what it would look like if you could do an experiment to look at the tension between the two theories. And that's where he discovered special relativity. And I do believe that even though there's so much we do not know about the mind and the brain, and I do believe we can apply the same methodology to these great questions and find some, some insights into these, these biggest of, of mysteries. I have some ideas on that, by the way. What, what, what are your ideas? <laughs> so um, so uh, one of my favorite ideas uh, has to do with uh, uh, the experience of time, flow of time. Um, <clears throat> and this touches actually two issues, the issue of free will and the issue of, of, of the flow of time. So some of the work that, uh, that I've been doing with um, Yakir Haronov is, uh, is the leader of our group, um, is we have changed the notion, the usual historical notion of, of what we understand as time. Usually we say, well, uh, you know, the past is gone, the present exists, but the only things that are relevant to the present are things that happened in the past. And one of the things that Yakir noticed long ago, 50 some years ago, was in fact that was only really half the story. That you needed to, if you really want to understand the present moment, uh, the future played as important a role as the past. And so this led to all kinds of new fundamental discoveries, uh, which, uh, you know, we, we quickly worked hard to make sure they were verified uh, experimentally. In, in my PhD thesis, I called these things quantum miracles. Okay. And what, what I meant by that were things that you could only discover if you allowed for the possibility that the future was relevant to the present. And so things like the quantum Cheshire cat separating a, a particle from its properties or a, a quantum pigeonhole, these are very, these seem to be things that were completely impossible, but um, as long as we did experiments, which include the possibility of the relevance of the future and the present, we got all these new effects that were confirmed. So bringing that back to the issue of free will, that completely changes the whole ballgame. Or, right? or the flow of time. And the flow of time also. Usually we think of the nature of free will, you know, okay, we're going to make a decision now, right? And the future hasn't happened yet. And so either one <laughs> result will happen or a different consequence will happen. And, um, but now if you bring in the possibility that something much richer happens with time, that the future could be relevant in those decisions, then it's a whole other way of analyzing it at a, at a very deep and fundamental level. And the kind of things we've discovered that came out of that have been really beautiful.